Hello, friends, uh, fellow composers, conductors, musicians, and others who have joined the South Asian Composers Dialogue. Welcome. I am Lalanath de Silva, and I am the host of this dialogue for today. Um, as you will see on the screen, um, today's topic is production and notation software. And we have two presenters, Sachitta Fernando, who's a composer and musician, Sri Lankan composer, and Lakshan Pereira, who's also a Sri Lankan composer and musician. We will spend about 90 minutes on this session. And once again, welcome. Uh, just a few preliminary remarks before we get going. Um, if you are, I'm going to meet all of, mute all of the participants, but if you wish to speak, you can unmute yourself. Or if you have a question or a comment you like to make, you can also use the chat box and write it down and we can then read it out uh, at an appropriate point in time. Um, uh, I hope you can use your basic commands. You can, if you have low bandwidth from where you are uh, joining us, you can mute your me video uh, and that way hopefully you will still see the screen and be able to hear the presentations. Um, here is our agenda for today. We will spend about 90 minutes, as I said, and I will start with a brief introduction. Um, and then we will have uh, the subject of production and notation software presented to us by Sachita Fernando. And thereafter, uh, very much focused on finale software uh, presented by Lakshan Pereira. And then we will have questions and discussions uh, thereafter. So let me start without more ado. Um, here is a, a picture of very early uh, musical writing in the West. So this is a mass, a Christian mass. And as you can see, there are four uh, lines here on which the notes are written down. Uh, here is a little indication that this particular line is actually a C uh, from which all you can then uh, calculate what the other notes are. And this is a setting of uh, uh, Christian scriptures to music. This is from about the uh, eighth or ninth centuries. And here you see one of the earliest forms of musical notation in the West, a four-stave musical notation. Very soon, by the 10th century, by 10, one, uh, 1,000 years after AD, 1000 AD, you had um, uh, a six or uh, five stave uh, musical notation being developed and sometimes even six staves. And this particular uh, uh, piece of music is attributed to Guido Arezzo, um, who was actually uh, credited, was credited with creating a more standardized form of musical notation. This is a musical uh, notation of uh, plain chant um, or Gregorian chant, which is the way in which uh, the scriptures were chanted in the church in the West. Then you have, uh, here is a very interesting um, uh, piece of music, which is again printed music, but you see how the notes are written and the stems are written on the other side compared to the way we write them now. Um, and interestingly, um, this particular piece of music is actually written on six staves. So you see there are actually six lines. So this is an example of a six stave musical notation system, also all ar around the same period of time. I'm going to jump ahead to uh, by a number of year, uh, hundreds of years, uh, when we come to 1600 or thereabouts, when Bach wrote this piece. This is a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach, the third Brandenburg Concerto. And here you see um, the, um, the, the, the composition written for strings, you have three violin parts, three viola parts, and three cello parts, and then at the bottom, the double bass and cembalo or uh, harpsichord part. And here, the top lines of each of these uh, sections of violins, the viola, and the cello is what we would call the, the concerti, which is like a solo group, contrasted against all of the others whom we would call a piano. Bach actually had very good uh, musical handwriting. You can see, you can read the notes uh, and, and see uh, the notation very clearly. Um, but in contrast, you jump another two, uh, uh, 200 years ahead and then you get to Beethoven. And on the left you see Beethoven's uh, handwriting, musical handwriting, and not as clear as Bach's. 
uh, and this is the uh, opening of his fifth symphony, which goes da 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 da. And there you see the instrumentation violin, violin, flute, 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 oboe, clarinet, bassoon, horns, trumpets, and timpanis. And then you have the double basses and violas at the bottom. So, so this is interesting because you have some strings at the top, some strings at the bottom, and sandwiched in between, you have the string winds and the brass. Now on the right hand side, you see a printed version of the fifth symphony. And this printed version, of course, the order of instruments is different. Flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, the woodwinds on top. In the middle, you have the brass, the horns and trumpets, and then you have the timpani. And then at the very bottom, you have all of the strings, the violins, the violas, the cellos and double basses. Um, and um, even during Beethoven's time, this first edition was published uh, and um, and so there was some differences between written and printed music. The way print music was printed at the time was you would have to engrave these notes and the staves on a piece of metal and this metal piece was then fixed to a printer and that's how the printing was done. Uh, quite complex, time consuming and therefore expensive process. Now we jump several hundred years ahead to the 20th century. And by the way, music was printed in this way that I just described for hundreds of years from the time of Bach all the way up to the 1950s, 1960s, even 1970s. And then you have the digital age when the computer age takes off. Um, and then you begin to see digital software um, for music uh, composers to write music on through their computers. Let me now share with you uh, my, my screen, which um, of the software that I use, it's called Finale Software, and you'll hear more about this, but I'm just trying to give you a, 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 quick, um, a quick sense of digital, the digital age of um, music writing software and notation software. Um, this is a concert overture that I wrote uh, way back in July, uh, September 2016. Um, and this is a, a composition that has now been performed by a, a, a couple of orchestras. Uh, and here you see the standard way in which music is now written digitally. And there you see the woodwinds, uh, much like the printed version. Uh, you have the horns, the trumpets, and, and the trombones, and, and so on, and, 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 there, and, and the tuba. And this forms the brass. And then you have the timpanis and the percussion after that, and then the strings. So very much a full, full. Uh, you have a full uh, score here, and it looks very much like printed music at the moment. And what's what's really important is uh, you can actually play this music, and it will play back to you with full digital, uh, digital sound, with full orchestral sound. And so I'm going to play this for you, uh, so that you 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 can hear this. Um, hear this for yourself. But let me just stop this for a minute to ensure that I am actually also sharing with you the computer sound uh, so that you can hear this music. So here we go. And so on. So with that, um, let me now uh, turn this um, uh, turn this um, session over to our two uh, guests uh, and uh, our presenters. Uh, the first of whom is Sachita Fernando. Now Sachita is. Uh, let me introduce him to you before he speaks, um, and he will speak about production and notation software. Uh, such is a very accomplished uh, composer and, uh, and musician. Uh, he uh, has studied under a number of uh, Sri Lanka's leading teachers, 
amongst whom is uh, Mr. Anand Dabare for, for violin, he's a violinist, uh, Menaka de Fonseca, Sachita also is a singer, and then Rubini Hapugula for piano. So he's had a fairly rounded musical education. He has a diploma of the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music for piano in 2011 and for violin performance in 2014, where he also was the prize winner for achieving the highest marks in the country for both of these. Now, in addition to all of these qualifications that he has, he also holds a science degree from the University of Colombo. I, I guess he graduated, was it this year or the last year? I can't remember, but very recently. And he had, there he studied subjects such as computer science, nuclear science, uh, uh, mathematics, applied mathematics, and so on. So he has both uh, uh, competence in music, but also competence in the science and the computer computer science background. Now he's written a number of pieces for orchestra. Um, in 2014, one of his compositions was premiered by the Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka. Uh, his compositions, a fanfare was premiered more recently uh, by the uh, Gustav Mahler uh, Society Orchestra. Um, and then he's also written film music. So, uh, so he has a fairly good knowledge about the different types of music uh, for which you can use uh, software for, for writing music. He's also the, uh, the concertmaster of the National Youth Orchestra of Sri Lanka, but also um, of, the, um, of the orchestra of the Gustav Mahler Society of Colombo. So without more, more ado, let me hand this session over to Sachita uh, to, to, to make his presentation. For this wide subject, so mainly, if you look at the big picture, composing software can be categorized into two types. That is, number one, music production software, and number two, music notation software. So music production software is uh, the software of which the final output is a finished audio track, which could be used in a film, or which could be written to a CD, or which could be played uh, to an audience, something like that. Whereas in music notation software, the final uh, product is a document, such as a PDF, uh, which you can uh, print out and uh, distribute among your orchestra colleagues or your friends and play. In addition to that, I, I like Uncle Alanat also uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation, uh, music notation software is also capable of generating a mock audio, what I call a mock audio uh, of what you're writing. So that mock audio is actually not a very professional grade audio which you can uh, sort of use as the final product, but in fact, you can uh, use it to, uh, to give your friends or your clients a rough idea about what you are doing. So let's move on. And first let's talk about music production software. In modern times, in our time, of course, uh, the music production software, they are collectively called DAWs. So a DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. This wasn't uh, quite what DAW st stood for uh, uh, back in the 1990s. So back in 1990s uh, or until like very recently, the DAW meant the complete system with which you were composing. That is the computer, the sound card or the audio interface, which handles all, which processes all your audio, uh, audio files and the audio editing software, which in our case is uh, what we call the digital audio workstation and input devices. This could be just the computer keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard and the mouse, or it could also be, uh, in addition, you could have uh, maybe a MIDI keyboard uh, or a MIDI controller, something like that. Yeah, before moving on to uh, the DAWs, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the role of a DAW. You can roll, like you can think of the role of a DAW as that of a kitchen without any ingredients. So if you look at this kitchen, you have the pots, you have a cooker, you have an oven, but nothing to cook with. So DAW can be thought of like an empty kitchen. For the kitchen, you need the veggies, the, the fruit, and then uh, the, the flour, the bread. You need these uh, items to cook with. Like that, for a DAW also, you need uh, some ingredients to make music with, which is given by VSTs and audio files. 
audio files means actually whatever you record like a solo violin you record or a solo vocal line which you may be recording like that audio files or vsts uh, well i'm going to talk about it in a moment so before that i want to talk a little bit about a composing system the basic uh, equipment that is required if you are producing music if you want to be a music producer first of all you need to have a computer and then you need to have what you call an audio interface this is the same uh, same thing as that of a sound card but uh, a sound card is something which you sort of uh, plug to your motherboard so it's housed inside your cpu whereas an audio interface uh, is a, a little bit different so that uh, what it does is it it houses the sound card inside the audio interface unit and in addition to that it allows you to connect mics and other line inputs into the audio interface as well as it gives uh, outputs such as for headphones and for studio monitors after that you need a good pair of headphones i say with a linear frequency response what is a linear frequency response so i'm going to zoom in on this graph or a flat frequency response so this is a graph of the frequency response versus uh, the frequency on the x axis you have the frequency all the way from 20 hertz to 20000 hertz which is the audible range of uh, the human ear and then on the y axis you have the, uh, the the frequency response indicated in decibels so if you look at the first graph you can see it's more or less linear okay there are some surges and some uh, falls here but it's more or less linear. If you look at the second graph, uh, like there's a boost here, there's a peak here, and the sensitivity in this range that is from approximately, say, uh, uh, maybe maybe 30 hertz to 50 hertz or maybe 70 hertz, it's not very uh, like not very sensitive in that frequency region. So this is what you call a tailored frequency response. A tailored frequency response is something where you boost or abate certain frequency ranges in order to achieve a practical result. So, for example, if you think of the earphones which you may be wearing when you are while you are jogging, you want to have a bit of a boost for the bass. Otherwise, you, you won't be hearing the bass very clearly when you are jogging. Uh, but you cannot use anything like that for composing. You need to have uh, your equipment with uh, with a very flat frequency response because this is going to be your reference. So what happens if you try to compose with something like this? So suppose this is the frequency curve of the head pair of headphones I'm using. In this one, there's uh, like this, uh, like the bass is going to be very much less compared to that of a normal uh, headphone with a studio grade headphone with flat with a flat frequency response. So in this one, I'll be bringing up my bass frequencies to uh, compensate. The, the tailored frequency curve in this one. So when I play that track on a normal setup or an audio system, there's going to be too much bass. Whereas if I do this, if I do my mix with this uh, headphone, what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, like compare it with the frequency response of this particular headphone, which is very flat. So when I play that one on, an, on, on a normal audio system, it's, it's going to very likely have the right amount of bass, treble, and highs depending on the audio system I'm playing on. So that is why you should always get uh, a headphone or any uh, any uh, like any studio monitors or any equipment with a flat frequency response for mixing and mastering purposes. Yeah, you can have a headphone, or unless if you have the budget, or and also if you have a very good soundproofed uh, and an acoustically treated room you can get a pair of studio monitors. But once again, there's no point of getting a studio monitor, pair of studio monitors just for the sake of uh, looking like giving, making your studio look good because most of the entry level studio monitors uh, aren't uh, like ideal for composing uh, purposes or mixing purposes. I mean, they just try to behave like studio monitors, but they don't actually do a very good job. So unless you have like a budget of at least a thousand dollars to spend on a good pair of uh, studio monitors, it's best to stick to a good uh, pair of 
headphones. In fact, with headphones, uh, you will have to spend less. At the same time, you can hear more details because your, your headphones are going to be just right next to your ears. So I have been using headphones and I'm really happy with that. Uh, what I have experienced is that when you use studio monitors, compared to headphones, set of headphones, the level of details you're hearing with studio monitors is somewhat less. Maybe once you get used to it, uh, you'll be able to handle it, but uh, still it's always better to check your mixes with a headphone indeed. And then we can have another input device, which is a MIDI keyboard. A MIDI keyboard is a keyboard which doesn't have sounds on its own, like there's no sound stored in the keyboard. In fact, it sends what we call MIDI data to, to the audio interface and then to the computer. So it is the computer that chooses based on the MIDI data it receives, what note to play and at which intensity, okay, or like uh, the emphasis of the note and the frequency of the note. Also, you can have a mic connected to your audio interface to record uh, maybe some vocals or a solo violin or a solo guitar like that. So that is why you really need to have an audio interface, not, uh, not a dedicated sound card, which is mounted to your, uh, to your motherboard. This allows the audio interface allows you to connect all this equipment uh, without too much of trouble. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about VSTs. So VST stands for Virtual Studio Technology. There are uh, three types actually, and this is a type of plugin. This, is, this isn't something which you can use on its own. So you have to use it in conjunction with uh, something like a digital audio workstation. So there are three types mainly. VST instruments, number one. Number two, VST effects. And number three, VST MIDI effects. Now let's look at each of them individually. A VST instrument is a plugin that generates audio. So when you uh, input a certain note with your MIDI keyboard into your DAW, uh, the DAW chooses which note to play according to what you play on the MIDI keyboard. So for, for the DAW to do that, you have to have a VST loaded into your DAW. So that is why I have uh, like described it as a plugin that generates audio. And then once again, uh, there are two types of VST instrument. Uh, number one, the virtual synthesizers, and number two, samplers. A virtual synthesizer is uh, a couple of oscillators or a series of oscillators generating different waveforms to achieve the desired pitch and the tone color of, uh, of that tone which you, which you are going after. So these are not natural sounds. These are uh, all artificial synth sounds. And the interesting one is the sampler. If you are really into orchestral music, sampler is what, what you will have to use. So a sampler is something which plays pre-recorded actual instrument sounds corresponding to the desired note. So think of it like this. Suppose you have a sampled piano. So actually, uh, before that, I think I have to describe what sampling is. Sampling simply implies recording. Okay, so, uh, if you have a sampled piano loaded into your DAW, and if you have a MIDI keyboard also connected to your DAW, when you press a certain key, suppose you press the middle C with a certain intensity, with a certain weight, and then the DAW receives the signal, and the DAW decides, okay, uh, you want... You it's want seven o'clock. So you want the DAW, it's okay, so yeah. You want a DAW to play, uh, the middle C at a certain volume level. So what it does is it picks from the sample library the right note required for that purpose. So uh, what you are hearing is actually a note which was actually recorded by an actual using an actual piano. So if you are sampling a piano, you have 88 keys in a standard key, piano keyboard, and uh, that means you have to record each and every note for multiple levels of intensities and for various articulations. So that's not, a that's not an easy process, uh, but once it's properly done, you can simply load this VST or the sample library into your DAW and you can plug in a MIDI keyboard and you can very easily play it as if you are playing that concert grand piano, which was used to uh, record those original sounds. 
not only for not only for piano this sampling can be done for other instruments too in fact it has been done for full orchestras choirs uh, various ethnic instruments percussion instruments so on the list is endless the other interesting fact about these samples is it uh, the, these samples come with controllable parameters that means you can control the intensity, the, the weight of the note you're playing, whether it's accented or whether it's very, very soft and very quiet, or you can even control the vibrato, like whether if you want your violin section to have a lot of heavy vibrato, or whether you want it to be very plain and very, just a very, uh, very simple, very simple, those parameters can be controlled. Uh, but actually it depends on the sample, sam uh, sample library you're using. If it's a good sample library, then you can uh, control those uh, parameters. VST effects are the plugins that process audios. That means these don't, gener these don't generate audio. In fact, they uh, add like, um, they, they perform the various, the various several processes on already generated audio files. So for example, a river, or it could be a mastering effect, or it could be, a, be some equalization. It could be a, a delay like that. It adds effects on uh, audios which have already been generated. Then finally, the third type, VST MIDI effects. VST MIDI effects are the, uh, are the type of plugins that process MIDI data and send to other VST instruments. So basically there's no sound involved in these uh, MIDI effects uh, VSTs. What they do is they perform certain, uh, certain uh, functions on MIDI data. Like for example, some data which you receive uh, from a VST, sorry, I mean uh, from a MIDI keyboard. And then they feed those MIDI data into other VST instruments. So the sound would be coming to those instruments from the MIDI data that was fed to, uh, to those VST instruments by these VST MIDI effects uh, plugins. Yeah, if you're talking about DAWs, there are like so many DAWs out there, but only a very few like very popular and very top-notch uh, DAWs. Namely, uh, if you are a Windows user, you might want to use Cubase or FL Studio and with Apple users, the very popular DAWs would be Pro Tools or Logic Pro. So uh, each DAW has its own uh, pros and cons. Now, if you look at FL Studio, it can be used very easily for producing what you call EDM or electronic dance music. Uh, if you have like uh, the same beat repeating for 64 bars and with a lot of layered uh, uh, layered synth elements, then you can do that kind of a composition very quickly and very easily with something like FL Studio. But if you want to produce a very serious orchestral soundtrack, then uh, FL Studio may not be the best for it. In fact, Cubase does it much better on a Windows system. Uh, I actually started with FL Studio, where, like when I started the orchestral composition back in 2013, and then uh, like it took about two weeks for me to like master the basic features, and uh, I was really happy with it uh, until some, uh, like until when I realized that uh, it's very difficult to use this for film scoring, because when I got my first film scoring uh, in 2014, I was still using FL Studio. And uh, there was a horrible issue with this one's video player that the video doesn't stay in sync with what you're writing. So if it's a four-minute segment that you're scoring, uh, unless you play everything from beginning to the end smoothly, uh, it won't stay in sync. If you seek uh, and jump to some point in the middle of the queue, the video and the audio doesn't really sync. And uh, the, this, uh, the, the publisher of FL Studio, Fruity Loops, they also didn't want to really uh, do anything about it, although many people were complaining about it. So I'm finally I had to make a very tough decision of uh, switching to Cubase. I mean, learning a DAW isn't very easy, so switching, you really have to make up your mind. And I had a very good reason, so I somehow switched to Cubase, and I have never had any regrets with Cubase uh, for the past few years, ever since I switched to Cubase. Also, FL Studio is quite heavy on graphics, so it, okay, like it uh, consumes quite a bit of your CPU processing power, Whereas Cubase is uh, not very uh, not equipped with equipped with very heavy graphics, which means you can very uh, easily achieve better performances compared to FL Studio. Uh, Cubase and Pro Tools seem to have a very similar user interface, uh, and Logic Pro is also not bad, but uh, it seems to be somewhat unstable compared to Pro Tools on certain 
at the system. VST instruments, now VST plugins and VS, uh, I mean the VST MIDI uh, effects and VST effects, those are not very difficult to produce, but the VST instruments take uh, a lot of uh, technical and musical expertise to produce. Now, for example, if you're producing an orchestra sounds library, you have to get each and every sec section of your orchestra to play each and every possible note on the instrument uh, and on, like with each and every possible articulation with each and every possible intensity. So that requires a lot of time and effort and a lot of technical expertise. So while there are quite a few uh, like people who produce orchestral sounds libraries, the, I, I have actually chosen to uh, talk about two, that is East West, West Sounds and Spitfire Audio. So East West Sounds ha have been the, like the market leader for a very long time. And Spitfire Audio is a little bit younger than East West Sounds, but uh, still they are doing really great with uh, their sound libraries too. Um, but I have always been using East West Sounds. So I have about 1.7 terabytes of uh, their sounds libraries with me, which are really good. And I have absolutely nothing to uh, complain about them. So those sound libraries include full orchestra, two full orchestras, choirs, then uh, ethnic sounds, then ethnic percussion, cinematic percussion, electronic elements, like lots and lots of uh, sounds, and the list is quite long. Digital audio interface, sorry, uh, digital audio workstation user interface. Now, although there are multiple DAWs, the user interface uh, has some very uh, common key elements. So the channel rec, the channel events, or that is MIDI and audio, and piano roll, those are very common to almost any DAW. So let's see what those are. So I have uh, I have here a screenshot of uh, my Cubase uh, user interface. So it looks a little bit complicated, but once you get the hang of it, uh, and once you know what is where, it's not very difficult to use. So this part is what we call the channel rack. As you can see, this houses all the channels I have uh, in this project. So in this part of the screenshot, uh, you can see right now, I have the woodwinds arranged in the form of an orchestral score, like starting from piccolo to uh, then going to bassoon. And then the brass, I have uh, soft French horns and trumpets, though, because I prefer to have the trumpets at the top, something personal. Uh, and then uh, trombones and tuba and a small army of percussion here like that. I have uh, different channels, one for each instrument. And in fact, as you can see, I have grouped them in sections. So these uh, woodwind instruments are kept under the woodwinds folder. The brass instruments are kept under the brass folder, percussion instruments under the percussion folder. So that's not something which you get in Cubase by default. This is something I created. This is a template I created uh, on my own for like for the, like just to make it easy for me to uh, produce orchestral music. And the next area you want to look at is the channel events. Now these are actually events, these contain events corresponding to these channels. So if you look at this one, uh, the piano channel, uh, you can see some patterns here. You can see some patterns here. So those are the notes which are being played by the piano uh, at this point of the timeline. And then you can see some harp parts here, and then some uh, wind chimes here and here. Those are the channel events. Now, when you double click on one of those events, you can edit or modify the notes, or you can add more notes. So if you double click on the piano MIDI event, this is what you get. These are the notes inside the, uh, the piano MIDI event, and this is what you call the piano roll. So this one actually has individual notes like that, and the note lengths correspond to different, uh, I mean, the, the lengths of these lines correspond to different note lengths. And uh, I ha now have a small demonstration of the, Q, of the, of the Cubase, uh, in which I'm talking more about, uh, like, uh, about the piano roll. So unfortunately, I had to uh, pre-record it because uh, of technical limitations. So I'm going to play that demonstration now. Yeah, so this is the main graphical user interface of Cubase into which I have loaded 
a short film score which I did at the beginning of April. It's a very short film, just one minute and just one minute animatic, and it's about the love life of a pianist. So on the channel rec, we have a I have a full orchestra plus some synthetic instruments. So if you select one of these instruments, like each one of these instruments, they have an S button and an M button. So the S is for solo. If you solo this particular instrument, it mutes all the other instruments in your project. And if you simply mute this one, it just uh, mutes that particular instrument. And these are the synth instruments which I have used just to uh, create some uh, ambient sounds. So let's look at one of them. That's one instrument which I just played with uh, my MIDI keyboard. And let's look at one more, this one. Yeah, so I have used uh, four synth instruments in this score. The other instrumentation is, uh, okay, the piano is the main instrument. And then in addition to the piano, I have used a string section, some percussion instruments, namely wind chimes, a triangle, a harp, and a suspended cymbal. Then three French horns and a bassoon and an oboe. And uh, here we have what you well, like what I mentioned earlier. Those are the, uh, the the MIDI events. So when you select on one of them, now let's go to the piano MIDI event here. When you double click on that, it comes like that, this. So these are all notes. And the length of this bus cor corresponds to the note length. So. These are short notes and this is a long note like that. And the color represents the intensity. So if it's red, that means it's intense. If it's blue, it, that means it's, it's like not intense. That's an intense note. This is a very soft note. Like that. Okay, now I shall play you the last bit of this uh, score. as you can see i have actually uh, grouped these uh, instruments into their respective sections so for example first violin seconds viola cellos and double basses have been grouped into strings so the advantage of doing that is it allows you to mute or solo the string section with just one click now if i wanted to listen to only the strings from the same place from bar 21 i can simply solo solify the strings and uh, i can listen to the string section with just one click And then when you uncheck the solo button, all the other instruments come back. Yeah, this is a different project. It's actually an action sequence which I'm uh, writing music for these days. So very contrasting material to what I showed you earlier. So I shall uh, play a very short segment from the middle of this sequence. Yeah, that's the end of the demonstration. Thank you. Yeah, so that's the end of uh, music production software. And now I'm coming to music notation software. Uh, the key functions of a music notation software is, uh, I mean, there are two key functions. Number one, writing sheet music. And number two, uh, generating a mock audio. So those are the key functions. And some popular notation writing software would be Sibelius, Finale and Musco. I mean, there are some others as well, uh, but uh, these seem to be the most popular among most of the music composers. And I have chosen to go with Sibelius because that's what I have been using ever since I started composing. 
uh, this is more like the industry standard notation writing software, which is mostly used by uh, most music producers. And it can effortlessly handle a score of any size, whether it's a single staff uh, treble flat notation or a full, fully blown orchestral notation, orchestral score, you, you can, it can handle anything very easily with so much ease. And uh, this also comes with the 35 GB sampled sounds library for mock audio playback. Uh, so it gives a very realistic, uh, a near realistic uh, reproduction of what you're, what you're writing in. Uh, but still you cannot use it as a final product. It's, it can only be used as, as, as a reference for what you're doing. It also allows real-time conversion of what is being played into notation. So if you press the record button on Sibelius and if you play something uh, uh, like with your MIDI keyboard, it can immediately convert that into notation, which is really nice. However, you can also input notes with the QWERTY keyboard and mouse, which I find uh, much easier and much faster than uh, playing, like playing and inputting notes with the MIDI keyboard. So I shall quickly do a demonstration of uh, Sibelius now. I'll have to stop the share. Yeah, so this is the user interface of, uh, of Sibelius. As you can see, uh, I have actually already added, I have created the project because, uh, because of a small technical limitation. It doesn't allow me to share the screen when I uh, show the first page you land on when you open Sibelius. But when you, op when you create, an, create a sample project, this is what you get. So you can input nodes uh, onto these stairs with your mouse initially. Now, uh, this is what you call the keypad. The keypad allows you to select the note value, like the, there is a minimum project century like that, it allows you to create, like select the note value, as well as any accidentals or any uh, articulation mark. Or you can also switch between notes and bests with the keypad. So I shall some, write something very simple. Uh, like so actually, uh, you can very quickly input notes with, with the use of the uh, the QWERTY keyboard, the normal computer keyboard. So if you simply use letters A, B, C, D, E, and E, F, and G, uh, you can simply write those uh, into your QWERTY. So now I'm going to select the note type as crotchets and first put this note here. And now I'm not using the mouse, I'm only using the keyboard. I press F, I press E, I press the E once again, then two Ds. I want to change the rhythm here a little bit. So I put a dotted quaver. So I have to select quaver and a dot. Yeah, there's a reason why they call it the keypad. These keys are mapped to your physical keypad on your uh, on your uh, computer keyboard. So without selecting with these notes with the mouse, I can quickly do it with the keypad. So one is mapped to a demi semi quaver two to a semi-quaver, three to quaver, four to crotchet, like that. So I want to select a dotted uh, quaver, I select the quaver and the dot, like that. And then, and then I want to have a semi-quaver here, and then a minim there. So you can very quickly write music with this one. Uh, let me stop the share for a moment. Sachita? Yeah, sorry, something went wrong, Angara. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think it's back online. 
Yeah, you're back online. Yeah. You can see the score, right? Yes, go ahead. Great. Yeah. So as you can see, the second part has uh, multiple voices, which have been very nicely uh, laid out thanks to the uh, uh, to this uh, user-friendly interface of Sibelius. And you can have tremolantos and they, like wh whatever you want to write, you can simply, I mean, I mean the Sibelius allows you to write whatever you want to write. Also, like uh, you don't have to worry about writing the parts mm -hmm. separately, like Uncle Lalanat also mentioned earlier on. Um, so if you go here and right click, you have all the parts here. So let's go to the first part. part. It comes like that, very simply. So you can with the with just a single click, you can get the separate part. Sajeta, I want so to is, keep, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you, but we need to keep a tab of the time. We've taken yes, more yeah. than so I, 20 I minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So that's uh, the end of the demonstration for Sibel, yes. And let's quickly look at I just want to, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to do. So I just want to quickly show the difference between the mock audio and what you produce, what you can produce with a Cubase, with sampled instruments. So this is the that fanfare which I just showed you. Uh, and uh, this is what the Sibelius output sounds like. So it's quite mechanical and it has a very synthetic sound. Sorry, sir. Satita, we didn't hear that sound. Maybe you have oh, to sorry. enable share your computer oh, sound. Sorry. Yeah, let me check once again. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just quickly play that once again. <laughs> As you can hear, it's very synth and it's uh, hardly human sounding and very, uh, very artificial. And this is what I did uh, of the same piece of music with Cubase using a very good sound uh, sample sounds like this. a lot of more details in there and a lot of more human character so if you want a, like a like an industry grade audio it's best to use Cubase but if you want a very professional sheet music you have to use Sibelius so that brings uh, us to the end of my presentation if you have any questions uh, please ask I think they can ask it during the Q&A session later on Michael, right uh, yes, Sajita. Um, we, we do have a quick question from Rukshan um, Vidyalankara, uh, who's online, and he says, Sachita, what's your take on analog orchestral sounds as against digital sounds you create? Are we missing the warmth of the analog? Uh, so that's his question. Uh, you can either answer that now or think about it and answer it during Q&A, um, as you wish. Uh, well, can I talk? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Rukshan, uh, would you like to unmute here? Yeah. You should be able to unmute yourself, Rukran, if you want to speak. speak. Let me unmute you. Okay, we can hear you, Rukran, if you want to speak now. Rukran? Uh, 
I'm not hearing Rukshan, but that's okay. Um, just yeah, just go I ahead and uh, yeah, you, you can answer his question if you like. Um, yeah, so actually I don't, I'm, I'm not too sure what he meant by the analog orchestra sound, like whether it's the, the sound that was recorded, uh, like when you were like recording uh, to, uh, to produce LPs, the 1960s, 70s methods, or the uh, digital CD and the sampled uh, orchestral sounds. I don't know which one he was referring to. I see, I see. You can tell us that. Yeah, Rukshan, you can ask yourself, uh, you can unmute yourself. Anyways, to give a general answer, like, okay, you can, of, of course, the analog sound is much better, that warmer than that, uh, that human nature, you can only get it with analog equipment and use of, by use of an actual orchestra. But the thing is, it requires, uh, it requires an Olympus budget to get an orchestra to record and to uh, produce it, uh, like, at a very good studio like maybe the Adobe Studios, which is my personal favorite. So compared to the cost of producing uh, producing an analog recording of an orchestra, uh, actually it's more rewarding to uh, get uh, like get your music produced with a DAW, it, like using a very good sound library, uh, if you don't have the budget. So actually like uh, I can, then all these uh, tracks which I played, I produce it from my home studio, which is right behind here. I'm not even using studio monitors. This is not an acoustically treated room. I use headphones. So with that, you can achieve very, uh, very, uh, very satisfactory result. Definitely, you cannot compare it to an actual recording made by the London Symphony Orchestra, conducted by John Williams, recorded at the Apparel Studios. But uh, you can get some really satisfactory results. So it, you have to actually compare it with the, like with the, uh, with the budget involved in the true processor. Yeah, well, th th thank you, Sachita. Um, uh, Rukshan, unfortunately, doesn't have a microphone, so he's not able to speak. But Rukshan, if you want further clarification, do type it into chat and we'll have Sachita try to uh, respond to your question um, at the end of this session. Uh, thank you, Sachita. Um, 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 uh, I guess Sachita has something to say. Please go ahead and, and continue chatting. That's fine uh, while we, we continue with the sessions. Uh, so, Sachis, if you wish to add something, you can type that in um, uh, or, or, or hold on. I, I just want to now also, uh, turn this over to Lakshan, uh, our second presenter. Lakshan is probably going to speak to you mostly about sound libraries. Lakshan is a young composer and, and has uh, and a musician as well. He, he is the choir master of one of our south, uh, churches in, in towards the south of Sri Lanka and has written a number of pieces of music. Um, I think he's written about 15 or 16 different uh, compositions now. Uh, one of his uh, compositions, uh, uh, the first uh, mass written by a Sri Lankan composer for orchestra and choir was performed recently by the Gustav Mahler Society. Um, and there are a number of other works as well, uh, which uh, he's written um, uh, for orchestra and different other, other combinations of chamber music. So let me hand this over to Lakshan. Uh, let me uh, see if you are unmuted, Lakshan, so that you can, uh, let, uh, let's see, where are you? Um, yeah, you're unmuted, yes. Go ahead, Lakshan, please. Yes, you can okay. thank you, Dr. Allah. And I would like to thank you uh, to suggest to propose a style for the second time. Last time we did it in 2018. Uh, and now a lot of things have already presented by um, Sajit. So, however, let's go to my presentation. Uh, let me share my screen. Right. Uh. Right. I have to uh, skip some of uh, slides because I think that's already uh, presented uh, some great things. Right. Uh, 
but in the past each composers was required to draw their own staff lines onto a blank paper uh, this is uh, my pen uh, which i was used in the past to write my manuscripts mm. eventually uh, the staff manuscript paper was manufactured as printed it serves as a labor saving technique uh, this is uh, you can see in my screen and uh, uh, then the composer could then compose directly music into line in pencil or ink until the arrival until the arrival of modern methods music had to be written in by hand for large scale works Mm, the copyist was to employ hand copy individual parts for each musician from composer's needle scope uh, that got a lot of time and a lot of labor and a lot of errors as mentioned by dr larana uh, but now with the advent of the personal computer in late 1980 and beyond music type setting now could be could now we accomplish by a computer software made for score writing purpose such as finale sibelius and this is great dorico and musesco which has reduced the necessity of music manuscript this computer software allows the composer or song writer to enter their melodies rhythms and lyrics to their compositions into computer using a mouse computer keyboard computer keyboard and a uh, midi keyboard uh, once composition uh, composition is fully entered to a composition score writer program the computer can be instructed to export the parts for all the different instruments like first violin second violin uh, like that uh, but remember both handwritten and computer based copying require significant understanding of musical notation music theory the music styles and conventions of different styles of music regarding appropriate tone ornamentations harm rules pertaining to accidentals and strong attention to all details and past conventions and i'm going to the autograph next slide uh it is autograph of the first page of Brahms fourth symphony and this is computerized the same symphony so you can see the difference and which one needs to clear right uh such is it all about um, music production equipments for the DAW and recording voice recording uh so uh, now i will show you essential equipment uh which are using for music scoring this is essential things you need to, you need the computer and music writing software and midi compatible device uh the keyboard is very good this is a 88 uh case 88 keyboard uh, a piano keyboard uh, which allows you to go the lower notes and higher notes so, uh how does musical notation software work with musical music notation software your computer does the job for you you connect the midi instrument directly to your computer and play the best that you said or output the part to be transcribed from the pre-recorded sound libraries as such it said earlier uh and i can skip the cp alias and this is uh musical of tas score of tas i'm using cp alias the best to me and finale even best mm. music score the basic uh, free software and all the five by sonic scores uh and uh this uh, sonic scores look like music score and finale features included with music score and finale features uh, and i can skip this uh, largest settings of the easy to use 
accounts by the loan and developed by the release of selling the part of heavy technology in the uh, 27 years old this is and you have a free you can download free version of the Radius first uh, but uh, don't care to simple uh, simple score with up to four instrument parts or oh, four steps you can add and this is uh, Sibelius, you have a lot of Sibelius versions and 9.99 US dollars per month. But uh, you have 16 instrument parts and Sibelius Ultimate, uh, you can score this Ultimate with parts and custom layout uh, 9.99 US dollars per month. And system requirements, uh, you have a very good computer, this is minimal requirements. And as I will say, this comes with 32 GB sound library. And I can skip this. Uh, and uh, I, I have to mention this uh, fully, uh, the Sibelius has uh, fully flexible magnetic layout collision organizer that uh, actually you can avoid the collision between nodes, slurs, expressions, text, and so on, and non limited staves. Mm. And I'm skipping that and in the exact instrument part we arrange feature. It had lots of a lot of plugins and meeting of nominations in world, so right. So you can skip. And this is uh, uh you can see this is the screenshot of uh Sibelius. And I'm going to finale. Uh, this is the most prominent. Uh, this, this is most uh, widely used software. Uh, prominent. Uh, this used by prominent composers and publishers and uh, institutions. Uh, and this is the best film scoring software that uh, I have mentioned. Some film, uh, Passion of the Christ, by the Man, Harry Potter, like that. Uh, and released on 1980, 30 years old, older than me, 31 years old, developed by Make Music, available in eight languages. And I would, uh, this is how it costs retail price 600 dollars, academic and theological 350, university and college institute, uh, new purchase, so upgrade. Ninety-nine dollars upgrade from previous version of Finale. If you want to upgrade from Finale twenty-five to Finale twenty-six, uh, you have to pay one and one hundred and forty-nine dollars. And system requirements: Windows Seven or later, four GB RAM, or four two and higher processor. AMD Athlon sixty-four bit processor is better processor. And I'm going to some features. Uh, Not trying to wear a MIDI keyboard, computer keyboard, then mouse uh, file. Uh, it, uh, in, uh, and file input, a variety type of files are supported. Uh, supported real time MIDI performance capture. Uh, you can hit the record button and play uh, your piece uh, by uh, MIDI keyboard, and it will type automatically into the software. So, a mess uh, and next, it's a massive event, the right library of over 500 premium Gariton instrument sounds. Uh, and uh, Gariton sounds made by uh, Make Music in addition to uh, basic MIDI sounds. And Gariton has a big, uh, has big uh, sound libraries, um, pre recorded sounds with real instruments. And human playback renders your music with stunning reels. The human playback uh, feature allows you to change your playback methods, change custom sound IDs as you wish. Which uh, this is a very good feature and powerful features such as Link Park, Notification, Educator Softwares, Tempo Depth, and uh, own, uh, free technical support. Aria player. Uh, this is a VST player, as I think mentioned about. The presentation, uh, the Aria uh, Aria player uh, 
uh, Arya player plays the uh, Arya player plays the Garrigan sounds uh, and effects. Transport rewi support. Uh, the rewi support you can connect this software to a DAW. Uh, digital audio workstations such as Cubase, SQL Studio, and Logic Pro. This rewi feature uh, was also included with Sibelius. Uh, and uh, all time signatures. Expanded Music Excel, XML import and export. Excel, uh, this XML is a common format which permits you to carry your score across another music notation software so uh, and as an example uh, a piece you have scored in music score or finale uh, you can export it as music in xml format and you then you can open it in sibelius and finale uh, that is a file format uh, which permits you to carry uh, your score across another musical software and Lakshan, can, uh, uh, yes. Lakshan, I'm, I'm, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, I right, want to I, leave I, enough time for questions and answers. So um, maybe you can move, move it on a little bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, and this is, this is free software. Uh, you can download it and experience it. Uh, and this has unlimited score and. Uh, these details you can find in catalogs in internet and YouTube. So this is uh, my fourth symphony score. I have scored I scored this uh, with this score and note five. Right, uh, now I'm going to show you uh, some my sound libraries uh, which I'm using. Uh, with for my works and uh, I uh, need some time to load. I'll show my fourth symphony. It must score. I'll take about five minutes more. That's okay. So go ahead and load that up, Lakshan. In the meantime, I'm I'm going to see if I can respond to one or two questions that have been. Uh, asked online. Um, one, one of the questions that has been asked is, um, it's a very interesting, it's a more philosophical question also, I suppose, to some extent. Um, uh, and this is from Rukshan. And he says, I, however, I am however worried whether the music of the future would be similar to a computer designed house compared to a house designed with heart and soul in it. I myself don't know the answer, and he he's, uh, he's, he hopes I can produce a, a, a suggest an answer. To be honest with you, uh, Rukshan and others who might have these similar thoughts, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, I am I don't have an answer. All I can say is I have some insights. So if you look at John Williams, John Williams does not score his music using Finale or Sibelius. He still sits at the piano in a studio all by himself and he writes uh, he sketches his music by hand and then this piano score with some indications i want trumpets here i want brass here you know and but it's essentially a piano score and he writes very much at a piano like like in the olden days and then that is taken by uh, a scoring a music scoring company who has number of people sitting behind computers using finale and they score the music and they send back uh, mock-ups for him to listen to. He will make some changes and he'll say, no, I don't like this here, change this instrument or this, this uh, you know, he might change some notes or et cetera. And that's how the score gets perfected to John Williams' uh, satisfaction and then parts are printed out and it goes to the orchestra. So that's uh, John Williams. But on the other hand, Hans Zimmer, who's also a very great film composer, he is he's very computer savvy. He knows uh, all of the software. He uh, mixes a lot of his uh, music with, uh, with uh, electronic sounds. 
And so he writes the music very much hands on. And you, there are even online courses that he gives on, on uh, which you can subscribe to. So these are two very different types of composers. I myself um, uh, am quite averse to using uh, production software, uh, and I'm not comfortable with it. Although I have, uh, you know, uh, dabbled in it. I always score my pieces uh, uh, directly onto the score using the software, but uh, instead of writing it by hand, I just write it on the computer now, but it's all generated note by note, slur by slur, staccato by staccato uh, onto the score. Whereas, um, as you can see, Sachit and perhaps Lakshan may be much more, being from a younger generation, much more comfortable using production software and, and so on. So I think it's a personal choice of each composer um, I'm not sure you will, you know, the question of whether there'll be heart and soul in the music you write, I think is partly dependent on the approach of the composer and their own uh, composing style and philosophy. Um, and yes, at one extreme, you may have computer generated sounds, robo, robots writing music, uh, robotic composers uh, with artificial intelligence into the future will write symphonies. But there will also be, uh, uh, you know, um, people, composers, men and women who write their music um, very much using a keyboard or using, you know, mm -hmm. computers. So I think you will have a mixture of them and you will, you know, listeners will have to make a choice as to which composers they like and which ones they don't. Uh, and I'm sure that will also be different. Uh, so that's the only insight I can give you. Uh, I, uh, and, um, you know, I think the, it's, it's, it's very much a personal choice of the composer and a personal choice of, the, of those who listen to that composer's music. So let me stop there. Uh, Lakshan, are you ready to continue? This is a very useful software uh, and basic. Uh, I think this is 110 megabytes for the download uh, and comes with basic MIDI, uh, MIDI sounds. And I have added uh, uh, custom MIDI sounds. Uh, and you can enter notes speed and play uh, and simple playback. And, uh, some articulations are not supporting music, music score that this is the uh, actually this is the uh, first step of mine and then I'll show some uh, my sound libraries which I'm using with uh, uh, with my Sibelius software and I'll play you uh, audio first this is from Sibelius. somewhat realistic sound. Uh, now I'm going to show uh, my orchestral sound library which I'm using. Uh, this is Amadeus Symphonic Orchestra, about 12 GB. Uh, oh, right. Uh, this player can connect with the my music software. Uh, I'll play through my MIDI keyboard. Mm. It is strings and zimbal. <laughs> Uh, 
pre recorded sounds and you have any orchestral sound in solo strings and and lordy violin solo violin and you can select uh, some articulation staccato marcato pizzicato you can change these to this uh these switches and you have to configure it to your notation software like uh, this is what i want to show now the time is going fast uh, i would like to hand over to dr lalna thank you thank you uh, th thank you very much um, lakshan we have about 10 or 15 minutes um, um, and i want to take this opportunity to thank both lakshan and sachita for their presentations uh, those are very uh, informative. I, I too learned some interesting things I did not uh, know or had forgotten about. Uh, and I'm sure our colleagues did as well. So if you wish to ask a question, you can all, uh, you can go ahead and, and unmute yourself and then ask the question or you can uh, certainly type it into the chat box and we can uh, read it out and discuss it. So uh, please go ahead and um, um, uh, unmute yourself. Any of you uh, wants to ask a question or make a comment, please go ahead. I know Harsha is online. Harsha, do you, do, uh, do you want to... Um, yes. uh, I know you've had some experience with this uh, writing music as well, so maybe you want to make some comments. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I want to encourage uh, Lakshan and Sajitha. Uh, Lalnath, I think uh, that question about, you know, whether music, like you said, it's a philosophical question, you know, whether will this new new technology sort of dampen your, your talent or your composing skills or your scope, you know, of output, you know, of what you put out, whether it will be human or not. I mean, basically that was the question. But this, I can remember when I was small, uh, you know, my, my father had a 620 camera, 620, you know, the 620 box camera, right? Uh, then some, okay, we used it in the family and then, and then sometime later, uh, when I was about 11 years, we got news about the SLR camera, right? Then mm -hmm. my father, who was a very knowledgeable, knowledgeable person, a lawyer, a lawyer like you, George Magan, <laughs> and he said, son, Anyone can take photos from this SLR, you know. Uh, but I, I used to argue. I said, uh, I no, I don't, I don't think it, it's, I think uh, it's just increasing your scope to the extent that you should be not become, you should not become a slave to technology. You should, you should be more, more clever to handle that technology so that you can, you know, go beyond what people are doing before, you know. And actually, that was right. Now, do you complain about the SLR? No one complains about the SLR. I mean, it's a basic mm -hmm. unit. So I think it's the same for music writing. I'll, I don't think Lakshan and Sajitra will be hampered, or their their talent will be brought down or dampened by any of whatever the technology improvements are. If they are clever enough, and I know that they are clever, two clever guys, you know, very very well, uh, they will handle it and they will bring out the best for this, uh, especially for, the, for our country and for the music world, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Harsha. No, that is, uh, uh, that is quite true. That is quite true. Um, I know that uh, there are others who express some views on this on the chat. Um, for example, I think, um, uh, I think I saw Satish, Satish Champion. Would you, you yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, I think first of all, I must, uh, you know, compliment uh, both the presenters. They did a fantastic job. Uh, I personally, I use Finale. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that uh, I had... Yeah, Satish, uh, tell us from where, where you're speaking. Are you, are you speaking from I'm India? I'm speaking from... 
that is correct i am uh, based in visakhapatnam oh, and uh, so i also I'm use so glad i'm so glad you're able to join very good we we are so all part of a, we are all part of a common uh, common uh, you know we are all part part of the mahabharat as they call it in, in ancient <laughs> times and i so, think it, you know it's it's time that we started talking to each other and yeah, and helping each other yes, please yes. go ahead please go ahead so so uh, the thing is that i i uh, from whatever we could gather from the concerns about heart versus uh, thing and uh, you know Uh, there was a time when you know uh, like during my father's generation and all they could just call the uh, you know stenographer into the uh, office and they could dictate out a letter which would probably go through just maybe one or two uh, iterations okay so but now with the advent of the ms word you know we find ourselves you know continuously restructuring our paragraphs sometimes we move entire paragraphs up and down so what happens is that you know uh, yes there, it is a fact that you know that we like to hear something like in finale we end up hearing what we have written but like you very rightly pointed out john williams is a perfect example of someone who conceives the music in his head and when it comes down on paper it comes down and it's it's to some degree of finality is there in it you know mm-hmm. so that is there but uh, the fear of you know having uh, one of the members had uh, expressed a fear that you know the music may become computerized i may not entirely agree with that i mean that's just my opinion i feel the computer aids the computer generation is basically aiding you to focus on your target uh, with a host of palettes and you know host of options which it gives so that you can use those options and you can get your ends achieved i think uh, i would go for that because i use finale and you know uh, if i didn't have finale and i had to write uh, you know a score for my uh, musicians i would find that you know i have to keep drawing lines i have to keep you know adjusting bar lines adjusting note spacing so that they come in line with the entire you know the entire band and all these things but finale does the job for me and you know i can just extract parts i don't have to start copying out parts for everyone and you know so i feel uh the computer if as long as uh, you know our uh, mind is focused on what our end result is i think you can exploit the power of digital world to uh, attain that now in so far as uh, the uh, uh, daw is concerned like what it was also very rightly pointed out that you know in one on one context it is where you are directly inputting sounds into an audio track the other one is where you are inputting notes into an audio track like when we are working with cubase and uh, similar such daws you actually play the uh, notes you send midi data and the tone generator which is the vsti in this case will uh, will take that midi data and it will assign a sound to it based on what we have uh, assigned using the vsti so you are directly inputting sounds inside a track which later on because it is in the standard midi protocol you are able to convert it into notation so that is one but finale of course is a totally different uh, ball game where you actually have to write notation into it and the notation thereafter becomes sound so i think uh, these are the fundamental differences which i found that uh, because i worked a little bit on cubase and uh, i just tried out my hand even at fruity loops but i still found i am a finale boy you know mm-hmm. where that is my core competency where i write a score and uh, you know uh, and the sounds are not all that bad if you just maybe you know run it through a vsti plugin it's got the facility of having a plugin uh, linked to it so it's quite good that way so i mean like that was, those were my takes but i think the uh, presentation was very good and uh, both of the both the uh, presenters i think uh, they really uh, brought a lot of uh, uh, information which probably even i didn't know about it so i was quickly you know checking up on my own uh, laptop parallelly so i think it was really nice very informative Thank you, thank, uh, thank you, Sachin. Uh, are there others who'd like to make a comment? You know, I actually have a the uh, the, the amongst the participants, I see a number of composers, songwriters. I see people, uh, some participants. I can see Anna Hampson, for for example, she's joining from Switzerland. Uh, she writes uh, songs of her own uh, and uses uh, software. uh there is uh, there are conductors online uh, there are chorus masters uh, i can see uh hari namit tanadan uh, so I, i'm so glad that we're all get, able to get together in this covid 19 days and be able to at least chat about a subject we're all interested in. so if any of you have questions or thoughts or comments or you know anything you want to share please uh, you can unmute yourself hello sir yes hello This yes. Hey, hi Kingsley. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Where are you speaking to us from? Where are you speaking to us? I didn't meet. 
Where, where are you speaking to us from? Yeah, I'm from uh, Tamil Nadu, from India. Go ahead. Yeah, first of all, I have to thank the two presenters. They did very well, and also they have given a lot of information about DAW, which is called Digital Audio Workstation. The thing is that what I feel in uh, feel that in upcoming generation, I mean, uh, I have a lot of friends, those who are writing in uh, DAW, using DAW. Th those people, they are not uh, using all these, I mean, music score, music score and Sibelius you know. They are just playing and input, I mean, inputting notes. Because, I mean, because uh, after coming DAW, there, there is, uh, I mean, I'm a music teacher, you know. I mean, no one is studying, I mean, music theory and, uh, I mean, compass and this and that and all. They are just, uh, straight away, they are using, I mean, uh, go to the contact patch and they'll uh, load string patches and they'll play the chords. So, uh, they, I mean, they don't know the fundamentals of uh, how to write music for strings and brass and percussion and all. So, this is what I feel. But the uh, thing is that some uh, very educated musicians, they are familiar with all the things. I mean, how to write a sheet music and, and how it should be converted to, I mean, DAW, I mean, for softwares. And also, I have a question that uh, I'm using uh, CPLAs as well as music score uh, for my writing. And uh, I have, uh, when I'm playing music uh, score, I mean, the sound is like a kind of artificial. So, I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not much about anything about uh, a score writers, I mean, softwares. So how can I, uh, uh, I mean, increase the quality? So I don't know how to host the, I mean, uh, VST instruments to the music score. So I'm using uh, Sibelius also. The Sibelius sounds are, is very good. As uh, the gentleman, I mean, such he said, there are three, 35 GP of uh, sample sounds that we can get some reality. And also I'm using Note Performer. The thing is that I, I'm, uh, using music score for my teaching whenever I uh, used to teach, uh, give some music sheets to my I mean my students uh, I'm, I'm using only music score only so just uh, I'm asking that uh, how can I uh, increase the sound quality I mean uh, how can I get the real sound in music score is there any possibility I'm just using only uh, I'm just <coughs> downloading the sound from the internet and just uh, I mean install, installing to the music score I'm just playing it so okay. that is my question, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kingsley. Um, all very good questions. I'm going to see if, um, turn this over to Sachita and see Sachita or Lakshan. Sachita, maybe you can go first. Uh, do you, do you, do you have a... Lakshan was go Sorry, I, I think Lakshan was going to talk about that uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe he should be able to give a better answer. Mm -hmm. Lakshan, do you want to take answer that question? Uh, yes, uh, Kingsley, uh, you can't use sample, uh, sample sounds with... Uh, Music score because it's very basic. Uh, yeah, it's uh, you can only use uh, sound fonts, which means yeah, MIDI course. files. MIDI files you can download uh, from internet some uh, somewhat uh, quality MIDI sounds, and you can uh, add those uh, MIDI sound into uh, attach those MIDI sounds into music score and play. But uh, music score default become um, with uh, basic MIDI sounds. I don't like those. Okay. Uh, and uh, you still we have uh, still we can't hmm. all right thank you lakshan uh, there's also a question from sanjeev niles hi sanjeev uh, and this is a question to sachita do you do the mastering of the audio track on cubase yourself well uh, yes the, uh, the the simple answer would be yes but unfortunately it's best if you can get someone else to do the mix and master because by the time you have finished your composition by writing about uh, 25 or 30 parts you are really uh, i mean you have got used to uh, like uh, all the mistakes the mixing mistakes in the in your final mix so it's best if you can get someone else to uh, do it for you but uh, unless you can find someone else, which is the situation in my case, I am the one who do like who does the mix and mastering uh, of my conversions. So thank you, Sachi. Is like, uh, just, uh, just one more point. Okay, thanks. Yeah. thanks yeah. Just one more point. Uh, go go ahead. Is, by, by, like after getting the final mix and master, I listen to a... Uh... No, 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 sorry. So that's all.
So what I do, like after getting the final mix and master, what I do is a technique I use is I listen to uh, I listen to that track on as many setups as possible. My audio system, my head, my mobile phone with the headphones, without the headphones, in my vehicle. I listen to it on like virtually every audio system I can find, and I take notes of uh, what I. Uh, like the imperfections that I come across, and then I attend to those uh, over a couple of stages, and that's how I do the mastering myself. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sajitha. Um, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, uh, if if you have questions, just unmute yourself and ask the questions. I just want to very quickly say that we are now over the ninety minutes, which is fine. In, and those who wish to continue to discuss. You're more than welcome to stay on and discuss, um, uh, and and uh, we have a Zoom version which allows us to go on as long as we want. Actually, um, uh, the presentations took a bit longer. I just want to make two very quick points in response to the uh, some of the questions that have come on on on, on the chat as well. There are if you there are two things here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is pushing boundaries. Composers have consistently, and, and musicians have consistently pushed boundaries throughout the ages. So at some point when Gaido Arezzo actually started writing music on the five staves, he was pushing the boundaries. When uh, Bach was writing the Toccata and Fugue in D minor, and, and he was testing out new organs, and organ builders would go red and you know be be biting their fingernails because he would really test the organ uh, and the bellows and see, you know, test the sounds that came out of it because he was pushing the boundaries. When Haydn wrote his first trumpet, the trumpet concerto, which is so popular now, it was not written for the trumpet of the day. It was actually written for a new invention which had fingerings, uh, uh, you know, which could actually have uh, make different notes uh, outside of the harmonic scale. And that's the trumpet he wrote. But today it has become the standardized trumpet concert for all trumpet players. Every time we are pushing the boundaries, and I think that is also true with software. We are pushing the boundaries. We are testing them out. We are creating new compositions, which you know was not possible before. We are mixing sounds and so on. And ultimate question of you know uh, heart and soul is really ultimately with the way the composer writes and the, the music and, and creates it. The second point I very want to make very quickly is why is it that Western music has become very popular around the world. I mean, you look at Japan, you look at Vietnam, you look at China, you look at Singapore, they all have fantastic orchestras. Korea, where I live and work uh, for the most part, uh, they all got fantastic orchestras. They are constantly performing Beethoven, Mozart. So these are Asian countries which have their own traditional music. But why is it that, that this kind of music, and then popular music, you know, whether it be your Michael Jackson or others, why is it that the West floods the South or the North floods the South with, with, their, with their culture and the music. And we, in, for example, are, is in South Asia are unable or struggling to get our music, uh, particularly in the new compositions heard in the rest of the world. There are two main reasons for that. Firstly, documentation. It is because Beethoven, Mozart, you know, Schoenberg, even the modern composers, John Cage, everybody else was able to write down their music and their thoughts in writing on a score that others around the world can take that score and reproduce it. If you only have it in production software, if you only have it in digital sound, then it is not going to be, it's going to be really hard for human beings to reproduce that. So documentation of your music is critical if we want our music to go beyond our little city or town or country. So that's the first point I want to make. So scores, scores, write your music down so that others can read it uh, and play it. The second thing, of course, is why, uh, the, why Western music has become, you know, global is because of the power of the media. There's a lot of controlling, uh, control of the media, of the television, of radio stations, which constantly blast this music out. Is, uh, is, there's, there's a lot of power in that and the West has a lot of control over that compared to our stations. So, so these are the two reasons, but at least uh, my appeal to all young composers is to document your music, write it down in a score form as much as you can, because that is the only way it can be preserved and then played by others outside of, of, our, own, uh, of our own countries, of our own cities, of our own you know, uh, states and so on. So let me just stop my, my preaching here and see if you, any of you have other questions. Okay, I 
don't hear anything. Um, is there something in the chat? Uh, Sachita, okay, I, your response is there. Um, do read the chat. It's quite an interesting discussion that's been going on on the chat as well. So I think, um, Harsha, did you want to say something? I see you unmuted. I, I really appreciate those two points, Lalnath. I mean, they are really valuable points to everyone, I think. Young budding composers and us and everyone, I think. Very good. Uh, congrats. That's a, two beautiful statements. Actually. Thank you, Harsha. So we're over time now. And so I think we should now bring this uh, session to a close. Um, I think this was really wonderful to have all of you. I can see some of you uh, uh, on the videos and, you know, though we cannot be in each other's presence uh, and, in, and, and face to face, at least we've had this opportunity. We will do this again. Maybe next time we'll talk about other subjects. If you have an interest in a particular subject, do write to me. Uh, and let me know, uh, look out for uh, an advertisement um, on my Facebook page and we will keep this dialogue going. We, we, I'm very keen to ensure that we build a new generation um, of composers from South Asia and that their work should be performed around the world. So with that, thank you to Sachita, thank you Lakshan, thank you for all of you who participated and stay safe till we meet again. Bye, bye bye. Bye, sir. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.